You're watching The Redefined Show on Adorama TV, and I'm your host, Tamara Lackey. On this part one episode, we talk with award-winning director, Pulitzer Prize-winning photographer, and popular educator, Vincent LaFerre, about how he pulled far and away from the pack. Adorama TV presents The Redefined Show with Tamara Lackey, where she talks with creatives who make it all work, bringing their best creative and business tips to you along with fresh ideas and equipment favorites. Redefine Show is sponsored by Adorama, the place to go for all your creative equipment needs. Hey Vincent, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. What are you doing here at Photoshop World in Vegas? Uh, I came to teach a uh, introduction, introduction to HDSLR mm -hmm. uh, video class for photographers making a transition uh, into video. Yes. Uh, I probably made their head spin a little bit too much because I didn't really make an introduction course. It was more of a medium to advance. Oh, they're like, uh, hello? I kind of tend to do that and yeah. just kind of sit there with their mouths, their mouths agape. And yeah. Going, um, what is all this stuff? I was showing Scorsese, I was showing Coppola, Spielberg, uh, different clips, uh, Robert Zemeckis from you know, Forrest Gump, stuff like that. Just explaining uh, what many of the directors were doing and, and why we do things like use dollies or why we use sticks or why we move the camera. Yeah. Uh, and talking more about the why and not necessarily the how, but we discussed that a little bit. But people get really obsessed about gear these days and they think, I have to have a slider, I have to have a steady cam, I have to have this lens. And it's like, well, until you know why, or what those things do and why you would use them, then you don't really know what you need. And mm. so the purpose of the course was to uh, introduce them to some of the best filmmakers out there. Yeah. And some basic stuff too. We did some, you know, basic one-on-one -on -one interview stuff, kind of like this. Yes. With B -roll. This good? Was it as good as this? Uh, almost, Probably better. <laughs> almost. And uh, we just kind of went through the motions, and I think the class had a good time. Now, when you say I explain the why, not the how, what's what to you is the difference? Well, that's I think everything in life, whether it's photography or life, is like you know you can go for the motions. But unless you ask yourself why you're doing it, there's not much purpose. What's um, the intention? What's the intention? What are you trying to accomplish? And a lot of times uh, when you use, especially in, in the movie making, you have so much gear. Mm -hmm. We all have a lot of gear in photography and we've all seen the terrible addictions to bags and lenses and filters and you know, you have the, the walking, you know, machine, the sink machine, about everything but the kitchen sink guy with things hanging all over. They're like, Who's that guy? I've never seen that guy. Oh, they're out there. He's you know, the guy the, who the shows all the stuff he's got. Yes, the, you know, the three yes, yes. Hanging, I have seen him at a wedding once. And yes. the guy can barely move and yeah. he can barely make a picture because he's immobilized it's a pack by the. It's a pack mule. Yeah. And then you see some photographers, uh, you know, that have one camera and one lens and they just, you know, shoot circles around other people and you're like, hmm, what's that literally. about? Literally. <laughs> because it's so free. Quite, literally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's part of the reason. And, um, you know, it takes time to learn why because a lot of times you learn why not. Mm. or why things don't work, uh, yeah. or why lugging a tremendous amount of gear will slow you down to where you're totally not productive. Uh, but eventually you learn, and that's what I try to help people skip over, is help them save money and not buy everything they see. Right. Um, tell them a lot to rent a lot of the video stuff that's out there as opposed to buying it because it's so expensive. And that is something that I don't think occurs to many people initially. It's a very different business model. In, in photography, we buy everything and we do everything ourselves. Uh, whereas in filmmaking, it's all about collaboration with other people that are more talented than you in their individual fields. So you, as a director, you work with a great DP, a director of photography, who's really well versed in lensing and lighting. Uh, and even a DP might have a great gaffer who's a specialist in lighting, and often they do, mm -hmm. uh, especially in cinema. And the point is, as a director, you might know a lot about lensing and lighting, such as myself having a photography background. Right. But when it comes to lighting a big film set, um, not only do I not know how to do it, but I don't really care because I don't have to. I can really just communicate as well as I can to the DP and, and that's gaffer brilliant. Like, and say, yeah. this is the kind of light, light that I want. It's very common for directors to bring reference books when they first meet their DPs and talk about this is stuff that I really don't like or this is the direction I really would like to go. And, and um, you, you feed off of that and you watch movies together because you know, if you're worried as a director uh, about you know whether it's a 2K or a 4K, and whether it's 280 or 281 diffusion, which is probably gibberish to most people, mm -hmm. uh, or opal or whatnot, or if it's half CTO, quarter CTO, all these little notes that you that, you, you that learn, yeah. um, it's not really your job as a director per se to know that. Also, um, as you know, uh, photography can be 
uber expensive. Yes. Uh, but when you enter video, it's kind of child's play. So one lens in still is usually between 500 to 2,000. You can find lenses that are $10,000 or not, but they're relatively rare and they're very specialty lenses. The average lens for cinema is at least 4,000, definitely 20,000, and more often than not, the zooms are $70,000, $80,000 a piece. Right. So if you're going out there trying to buy everything, you're just hopefully have a, a big bankroll. Yeah, or you're just going to go out of business really quickly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and why did you transition from photography into filmmaking? I'd always wanted to. Uh, I grew up around a film uh, family surrounded by film. Uh, my father was a set photographer. Oh, so actually know. my first memory was being on a set with two Mercedes uh, driving into each other, two stunt cars. That's your first and memory? One of my first memories, yeah. How old were you? Uh, I don't even know. I think I was going 18, to my dad. 19? No, like <laughs> six or seven. Six uh, or seven. And I remember the machine gun fire very, very vividly. Yeah. With blanks, obviously. But uh, I always, he, and then my father worked for Premier Magazine in France, so he would take me on film sets all the time. And so I always knew. When I was 18, I decided to go into photojournalism, and I did that for a little bit over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then four years ago, the 5D Mark II came out, and that was my big opportunity to just kind of jump into uh, the filmmaking yeah, world. Yeah, because you were very, well, are, but very yeah. successful in that thing, and most mm -hmm. people, when you get there, you dig in, yeah. not say, let me make a whole huge transition. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I saw it, I saw it as a tremendous opportunity, and it was so much fun. Yeah. Uh, Reverie was shot uh, over two nights with a very small budget that was self-funded. Uh, there was no client. Ken literally expected an email that Monday, and instead we delivered them a little short film that went viral. It was seen two million times in the first week, and um, because of that camera and that little video, uh, it's fair to say that a lot of people in the video world that never heard of me uh, were talking about like me, exploded. whether it was at Disney or whatnot or yeah. Universal Studios, because I met a lot of the CEOs and, and production heads there. As a result, I was invited to Industrial Light and Magic to speak to 500 mm. people uh, with a very small experience in filmmaking. Uh, right. So it was daunting, but it was definitely a, a big moment in my career. And I think you have to just go with it. Take you know. it. <laughs> take it. It doesn't come often. What would you say has been your mindset throughout the entirety of your career that you feel has separated your career from others in terms of your level of success and, and focus? Uh, there's two main things, or three. One is uh, I've always studied my mistakes, not my successes. Mm -hmm. So when you make a great image or a great film, uh, don't study the good parts about it because you're probably aware of them. Study the weaknesses and make sure you never make those mistakes again. And if you can really never make a mistake twice, you're going to exponentially succeed. Yeah. Um, the second one is refuse to take an image or shoot something you've seen before. Uh, if it bores you, it's going to bore your audience. And that's something I really lived by when I was a staff photographer at the New York Times. I would see a lot of images and I'd say, I've seen that a thousand times or I've shot it a thousand times and right. I'm not going to do it again. I just refuse to do that. And um, I would just, you know, see a pack of photographers and go the opposite direction every time. And then lastly, what was the last one? Um, take chance, oh, uh, welcome change. I think change is one of the scariest things in life. It's one of the biggest stress factors for human beings. Yes. Uh, whether it's in relationships, whether it's professional, whether it's gear, uh, whether it's the weather. People just don't react well <laughs> to change. Sunny. They like things to be constant and yeah. comfortable. And the difference for me is that I, uh, I've always been a change addict. Uh, mm. I love new things, uh, you know, shiny, ooh, you know. And, uh, but more than that, I just, it's, there's a thrill about being on the cutting edge. There was, you know, I got to work with several prototypes when I worked, um, you know, with Apple and with Canon and other When you were companies. working with Apple, what were you doing? I helped them with Aperture and some other stuff. Oh, okay. And uh, when you get to say you're the very first in the world to get to do this, mm -hmm. there's a big thrill. It's not quite like walking on the moon, you know, <laughs> or going out in space. Yeah. But it's as close as I'll probably get. Yeah. And there's a little part of that, you know, that's really exciting. You know, what's interesting to me, just sitting here talking to you, is that your demeanor is very relaxed and low-key and easygoing. I'm heavily medicated. Is that what it is? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but you are. Your, your energy is just like laid back. It's cool, et cetera. And, but it, but yeah. the description is thrill-seeking. Yes. And it's an interesting dichotomy. Well, it's a little bit of an on and off switch, to be honest. Um, and um, I think it has to do with having done 20 years of breaking news, mm -hmm. where things were really changing fast, yeah. and you couldn't predict them. They were breaking, and you had to react on the spot. 
Uh, and you have to learn to relax. And you have to be super calm. You have to be super calm because yeah. there are dangerous things happening around you. And if you let the emotion take you over, you're gone. If you're at the World Series, I've covered, I don't know, seven, eight, nine of them. And you're at, you know, bottom of the ninth, two outs, three balls, two outs, uh, two, two strikes. Um, your heart starts to beat at, you know, two million beats per second. And you have to take a really deep breath and say, this is just one more pitch of the thousandth, you know, that I've shot yeah, this year. Yeah. Because if you realize that the result of that pitch will determine who wins the World Series, you're cooked. Right. Happened to me once, my mistake, never made it again. But what, my, did, what, what, what did you actually do? I, you panicked? I, I, no, I just had emotion and I didn't react as well as I could. It's like being an athlete and not being focused. Hmm. Uh, it's a very similar mentality. I, I let the emotion get the better of me. And I may have made a few mistakes or been a few split seconds late, but that was unacceptable to me because I was surrounded by the best photographers in the world. Right. And I realized that, you know, what scared me after a few years was that I had gotten so good at being ice cold that I was like, well, that's the, uh, that's the, the polar far. opposites too far. Turning it's to like you're, you're dead. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you got to find some balance. And also as a director Wait, now, yeah. That's very, I'd love to pause yeah. for a second because that's very interesting because it's mm -hmm. also not unusual mm -hmm. for people who are constantly in a combat situation, yeah. whether it's war or yeah. it's um, it's just a, a colder kind of mm -hmm. tone is the only acceptable tone. Well, they're just crazy, but. Um. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. how do you, but, but obviously well, so much regular, of photography and filmmaking is For someone is who does that, regular life is, is detached. Right. You can't really relate to regular life because you see the worst things in human beings and the best things. And you come back to everyday life and you see, you know, the Prada shoes and the Louis Vuitton this and you're just like, you, you have a very hard time relating. Yeah, it's like, ugh. But, you know, especially as I was going to say as a director, um, I've got between 5 to 30 to 60 to 150 people working with me at times. And very common for them to all look at me at one point and say, what's the decision? And when you have 150 pairs of eyes looking at you, it can be the, oh my God, I'd run, I'd suddenly being the director is not the coolest thing on the earth. It's the scariest thing. Huh. And if you remain calm and collected, uh, more often than not, it works out just fine. I just think it's so interesting because of the fact that what we respond to when you're watching a film, when mm -hmm. you're um, really struck by an image, is you're responding mm -hmm. to something that you feel when you look at it. That's the idea, and that's why I tell people when we did the workshop is, if you don't understand what the gear can do, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to get that emotion out of your audience. Mm. Every move has a purpose. It's a psychological purpose. It's an emotional purpose. You're trying to get some sort of emotional or intellectual reaction from your audience. And the way you move a camera, whether you're moving from left to right or right to left, it's called screen direction, will actually have an impact because you know most Western people read left to right. So when the camera moves in that direction or the image moves in that direction, it feels comfortable. But you pan in the opposite direction and suddenly it feels a little bit uncomfortable. And you don't know why. The audience has no idea huh. why, but the director and DP are, you know, if they're well versed in cinema language, know exactly what they're doing. Interesting. So the scary music comes on, it goes right, and you're like, something's not happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, or everything in the direction of the screen's going one direction and suddenly something goes the opposite direction. It's usually the monster, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not all horror films. It can be, you know, a lot of subtlety. And yeah. Stuff, yeah. Or just like mental, emotional drama. Thanks so much for watching part one and tune in next time for the really cool part two. In the meantime, you can check out much more content with photographers, filmmakers, and entrepreneurs by watching Adorama TV. Photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. Place your order by 7 p.m. and it ships the same day. Plus, the next time you're in New York City, be sure to visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. Check out the Adorama Rental Company for professional cameras, lighting, computers, and more. We'll help you make the best selection to match your needs while giving you the knowledge to achieve the best outcome from your rental. Adorama is your complete solution for equipment, printing, training, and more. Adorama, more than a camera store.